We Americans take for granted those huge power lines that crisscross the countryside. And now those power lines are getting even bigger. And some scientists worry they may be hazardous to the health of the people who live near them. Some of those people have decided to fight. Well, you fellows in New York City is going to be sitting in the summertime in a nice air-conditioned office, sitting on your fannies. We're going to be sitting on a tractor here in probably 90 in the sun or 90 in the shade, working on the this and, and getting shocks from the damn thing. America is power mad. We need electric power to keep our cities lit and cool. To get it, a network of high-tension lines has sprung up across the landscape coast to coast. They began as mere strands, almost like lonely clotheslines against the sky. But then they multiplied and they got bigger. At the turn of the century, 11 kilovolts, then 100, 230, 345. And now the giants are upon us, the monsters. 765 kilovolts. In each of those lines, enough power to light a city the size of Philadelphia. It's these monster lines that have begun to worry some scientists. They're not sure they're safe for the people who live under them. And the people who live under them have turned angry, some of them, about the power lines. The 765 kilovolt lines work beautifully. They carry four times the amount of power of a line half their size. But in states like Ohio, New York, Wisconsin, California, people have stood in bitter opposition to their construction. They've heard stories from people who already live under the huge lines. When I've got a tractor around there, I don't fill a tractor with gasoline under that line or around it. I see. I get clear away from it because, uh, you know, if it's spark air, you may set it off and burn you up. Despite assurances from the power companies and most of the scientific community, they've heard about a few scientists who worry that living near those huge lines can be a health hazard. Uh, at the location of their houses, at the location of the factories where they work, at the location of the parks where they play, the electric field strength is such that animals exposed to that same strength in the laboratory have had their bodily functions affected. 60 minutes travel to far northern New York State, where one such fight is going on. It's a peaceful-looking spot, some of the best farmland in the country. Folks up here are conservative. They'll usually answer an outsider in one-word sentences, until you mention the line. This is what they're talking about, these giant erector sets sprouting all across upper New York State. 120 miles of them to carry lines, to carry power to the folks down south in New York State. The power companies say they need the electricity down there. But the folks up here in the North Country have an answer for that. Well, you fellows in New York City is going to be sitting in the summertime in a nice air-conditioned office, sitting on your fannies. We're going to be sitting on a tractor here in probably 90 in the sun or 90 in the shade, working on the this and and get shocks from the damn thing. But you just won't get shocks sitting on your fanny in your air condition and staying nice and cool, but we're gonna sweat. Well, he's right, because New York City, as we learned last July, has built itself into a summertime energy nightmare. And it's not just New York City. Air conditioning in most new buildings is no longer optional. Even if you wanted to save electricity on some of the cooler days, you can't, because they've built the windows so you can't open them. So how do you keep a city like New York cool? You look for huge supplies of electricity. And those people in upstate New York, 400 miles away, live on a line between New York City and a substantial source of hydroelectric power across the border in Quebec. The farmers were offered money for a right-of-way across their land for the power line. When they refused, the power authority got a court order and went on to their land anyway. Those who tried to stop the construction were put in jail. Are they polite about it? Oh, definitely not. Uh, you smile. I smile because they're not. They, uh, they're they arrogant. They angered us the moment they came in the house and started pushing contracts under our noses and saying, sign them. And I mentioned getting a lawyer. He said, it won't do you any good. Our lawyer always wins. We said, you know, it, it looks as if we sign all our rights away if we sign it. Oh, no, no, no. You, you, can, you can get damages. You can get this. You can get that. You can get the other thing. We said, put it in the contract. Oh, we can't put it in the contract. They come in and they tell you we're going through. Whether you want us to go through or not, uh, we're going in. And they did. But if the power companies thought a few North Country farmers would be easy pickings, they were wrong. A huge elm tree on the Stella Bars farm became a symbol for the protest. 
The farmers, joined by some Indians from the Mohawk tribe. In the end, the tree fell, and its defenders went to jail. They lost the tree, but Stella Barth and her friend Jane Running Doe insist they've just begun the fight. I think a lot of people further down the line actually expected the Mohawk Nation and the Fort Covington farmers to stop them right here, that they'd never get beyond us. Stop them how? Just, just by blocking, just by holding up their work, just by costing them a lot of money. They'll cart you off to jail. They've done that. Yes, and they'll do it again. Maybe. I don't want the power authority to experiment upon human beings without their permission. They had appealed to the governor, Hugh Carey. His first comment was that all the trouble was caused by outside agitators. Nice to be here. And then he came to the North Country to talk to the county's annual Chamber of Commerce dinner. They were waiting. The governor listened. The farmer said he'd give the state land for the line through a woods he owns if they just wouldn't run it through his best meadow. The governor told him to contact the New York State Power Authority, PASNI it's called, down in New York City. Well, that's where we went, to ask PASNI's general manager, George Berry, about that particular farmer's request. What are you supposed to do? Keep negotiating with uh, every individual farmer that uh, you meet and say, where would you like it? It'd be a committee of 500. You'd never get the line built. And uh, maybe that comes off arrogant. I don't know, but I think it's the only way you can build a line from A to B and make any sense out of it. The private right versus the public good. That's right. Well, the private right is supposed to be protected here at the state capitol in Albany. The Public Service Commission for three years has been holding public hearings on the safety of the line, and they've still not made a decision. PSE Commissioner Edward Berlin. But at the same time that you're holding the hearings, you're building the lines. You're spending, I don't know, $100 million? Yeah, that's correct, and I assume that you're going to ask me, haven't we not, in fact, prejudiced the outcome of the inquiry into health and safety by allowing that to go forward? That's and that's a, a fair question. I think that's a very uh, good and question. And it's the question that we precisely asked ourselves before we permitted construction to take place last June. We were convinced at that time, and we remain convinced today, that we have in no way prejudiced our ability to respond in whatever way we have to in order to protect the public from any credible health or safety danger that's revealed during the course of these hearings. We listen to people in southern Ohio tell us they've lived under these lines. They've told us about being knocked off a metal roof when they tried to paint it or getting shocks from their farm equipment, well, or total interference with radio and television programs. Well, uh, I, I have to believe that those are very gross exaggerations. 